I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates, and we're going to be talking today about the very first donors to Pete Buttigieg's mayoral campaign. Now, um, in, uh, on April 1st, 2019, just last year, at the end of the first quarter of presidential fundraising, Pete Buttigieg sent out an email to his supporters uh, announcing that he had taken in $7 million, which was quite a bit for his first quarter. He wrote, quote, this is a big number for us. We are not part of the national political machine. Now, it didn't come out until later, but the Wall Street Journal reported, ended up reporting later on, that in March 2019, the month before uh, Buttigieg sent that announcement to his supporters, uh, the journal reported that a half dozen top fundraisers for President Obama had begun working together for Buttigieg that March. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because there's a question of what's, what does it mean to be part of a national political machine? Is Amy Klobuchar part of a national political machine? Is, is Elizabeth Warren? Is Joe Biden? Uh, if you have six of Obama's top fundraisers working to get people to donate money to you, are you part of a machine? On January 29th, 2011, when he kicked off his mayoral campaign, Buttigieg told a crowd of more than 100 people at his headquarters, quote, I'm not an incumbent, not the product of any political machinery. In his book last year, he says something similar. He says, I belonged to no faction and could arrive without strings attached. Last year, uh, the, um, I should point out, by the way, that there's been no way of testing how true any of this has been uh, because of two factors. One, the local media at the time, I would say, sorry local media, did not do a great job of vetting or kicking the tires on Buttigieg's claims about the people and forces behind his campaign. The other factor is that since 2015, all of Buttigieg's campaign finance records for the 2011 mayoral race have been gone. The official copies no longer exist. I reported that back in April last year. And I also asked the Buttigieg campaign at the time, do you still have copies? And if so, will you release them? The Buttigieg campaign has still not responded despite repeated uh, requests reiterating that question. Last summer, I got Buttigieg's, I independently found Buttigieg's second filing for, 2000, for the 2011 campaign, covering essentially the first quarter, roughly the first quarter of 2011. And I spoke to uh, campaign spokesperson Sean Savitt at the time, this is a presidential campaign spokesperson, asking him about some of the special interests and lobbyists that, that the Center for Public Integrity and I found when we collaborated on a story about that filing. Here's what Sean told me, quote, when Pete first ran for mayor, he had strong grassroots support from his friends and neighbors in South Bend, as well as his friends and contacts. But again, what differentiates the friends and contacts that Buttigieg had at the time from the political machinery that, by implication, his uh, rivals enjoyed the support of. And we have not known um, up till now what his very first support looked like, who his very first supporters were, the people who put money into his campaign before he went out and knocked on a single door. We have not known that um, publicly. Now, uh, as it turns out, I actually did uh, obtain the very first forms from 2010, documenting who were the very first people who donated money to Pete Buttigieg's mayoral campaign, his first successful political campaign. You may have noticed I mentioned that in my previous story because one of those donors happened to be the stepfather of the white firefighter that Buttigieg chose to replace the long-standing uh, black chief of the fire department. And the, the new donations, the new filings, were kind of buried down there because of the bigger story that I got out of the fire department. Both Howard Buchanan, the, the former fire chief, and Kenny Marks, the former firefighters union president, uh, being gracious enough to speak with me. What I never ended up doing was reporting on everything else we found in that very first filing. So that's what I'm going to do today. So. This is exclusive reporting, exclusive content that we have not shared with you in print yet. So we found there were 60 separate donations in that filing, including six businesses, three political campaigns, and 46 individual donors. 
Out of those 46 individuals, eight were women. Women accounted for 200, excuse me, $2,325, which was almost 4.4% of Buttigieg's total donations in that filing uh, period, which were $53,230. So women accounted for almost 4.4%. Uh, the biggest donation from a woman was $1,000 from Mary Downs, who was um, actually right offhand, I'm not sure that's correct. It might be 500. Um, but uh, that came, the biggest donation was from, um, uh, there were two donations, two big donations from women. One was from Jill Long Thompson, who was the former gubernatorial candidate in Indiana and for whom Buttigieg had worked. Another was from Mary Downs, the former chief of staff to former governor Joe Kernan, an early Buttigieg supporter and backer of his campaign. Uh, the largest donation from a woman, as I said, was $1,000. The largest donation by man was $10,000. Switching from gender to ethnicity, uh, out of the 47 individual donors, um, but also including people who controlled or ran the businesses that donated and the political organizations, out of all those people, we were able to identify only four non-white people. Um, none of them from South Bend. Now, by contrast, Buttigieg got five donations from white people named Brown. Uh, one of the four non-white donors was a woman. The other three were men. Uh, none of them were uh, black men. The closest thing we could find to a black man who donated to Pete Buttigieg was a white partner at the law firm Black Man and Graham, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Uh, okay, altogether, the four non-white donors accounted for $200 of the donations given to Pete Buttigieg in his first filing period. Um, oh, Grammy, uh, we just got a super chat from Grammy uh, thanking us for our great investigative journalism, saying thank you, thank you very much, Grammy. And I neglected, I missed on Friday... Milo also kicked in a super chat. So uh, Milo, thank you so much. And I apologize for missing you on Friday. I made a mental note and a physical note to thank you today and blew right through it. So I apologize, Milo. And thank you for reminding me, Grammy. Um, so um, as I was saying, the four uh, non-white donors that we were able to identify accounted for $200 or just under four tenths of 1% of Buttigieg's initial fundraising. Now, um, when Buttigieg spoke about not being the product of a, of a local machine, uh, one reason he could do so without being challenged on it was because the local media did not challenge him on it. And in fact, there were some almost amusing examples of the disparity between how they, they were willing to have the race be characterized and the specifics they gave. Let me read uh, from a draft of the story that we never ended up actually publishing. Buttigieg's proclamation that he was not the product of any political machinery was reported by a local TV station. I found it on their website. Three sentences later, three sentences later, after saying that he's not the product of any political machinery, the story unironically quotes a Buttigieg supporter talking about the audience at his announcement, saying, quote, there's some big players here. The person talking was the county auditor an elected political position. Other big players on hand included the former mayor of the city, uh, Roger Parent. The announcement itself occurred in a building that was owned by the biggest, the single biggest kingmaker in, in South Bend politics, Bob Urbanski, a wealthy uh, contractor who first got involved in politics, city politics back in the 70s, and was actually the chairman of Buttigieg's campaign. Um, now, by contrast, Buttigieg's rivals, a guy named Ryan Dvorak and a guy named Mike Hammond, they were, uh, they, their connections tended to be characterized much differently by local media. Um, Dvorak, by the way, uh, so Dvorak had, and we know this not because I have their filings, but because of the local media. The local media reported on Buttigieg, not part of any political machinery, but then gave lots of details on the political machinery behind his rivals. So Dvorak 
got seven donors as opposed to the 50 some, 50 some odd who gave to Buttigieg. And Dvorak had, at the end of the filing period, 8,700 as opposed to the 50 some odd thousand Buttigieg had. The South Bend Tribune noted that all of the donations to Dvorak came from Indianapolis. What the Tribune did not mention was that Buttigieg got more money from outside South Bend than Dvorak did. And the newspaper's observation that Buttigieg had far more small donors than his rivals did omitted the fact that almost all of them, almost all of them came from his networks or, and this is important, from political networks that he in, either inherited or got into via Harvard, via his political, uh, his own political work, right? Working for Jill Long Thompson, working for John Kerry, uh, people like that. The Tribune said that Dvorak's seven donors included people who worked for, quote, entities that typically might hope to win city contracts. So if you mention that Dvorak donors worked for entities that typically might hope to win city contracts, typically, you would think that you would mention that Buttigieg's donors included people who didn't work for but owned entities that not might hope to win city contracts but already were getting city money. And some of the, his donations came literally from the businesses themselves. The business themself wrote, themselves wrote checks. And most of the businesses had ties, if not strings, to both South Bend politics and city money. Um, let's talk about some of those businesses. So, there was a Michigan Republican who gave Buttigieg $5,000. Again, before he had announced his campaign, this Michigan Republican gave Buttigieg a, a check for $5,000. Three months before he wrote that check, his company had won city approval to build a $6 million industrial shredder, which was controversial because of noise concerns. The shredder went bankrupt a few years later. Then there was Frank Baskovich from 70 miles away in Kendallville, Indiana. And I was being a little snarky when I wrote this. It says, he was so moved by love for South Bend that he gave Buttigieg a thousand dollars. The year, um, so, uh, the, so, just, so Buttigieg is, is elected in 2011, takes office in 2012. In 2013, a local activist exposes the fact that Baskovic, the, the, the $1,000 donor, his company is allegedly double billing residents uh, of South Bend. In other words, this contractor does work on the property based on the city saying, hey, we want you to clean this up. There's a sewer problem or whatever it might be. The business owner allegedly billed both the city for the work and also billed the residents for the work. This went on for two years after it was exposed. Not until July 2015 did the city take action. Oh wait, not the city, the Common Council and the Board of Public Works. They moved to suspend the company, remarking on the company's continued good standing with the city. Council member Karen White said at the time, that doesn't make sense to me. I want to turn to the idea of the, the machine, which, again, Sean Savitt, the presidential campaign spokesperson, sort of characterized, you know, a grassroots network of contacts. Well, I'm not sure what a machine is other than that. Um, grassroots is a pretty subjective term. Here's what Buttigieg writes about his own campaign in his book, quote, my friend Mike Schmuel, architect of then Congressman Joe Donnelly's unlikely 2010 re-election, promised to run my campaign. I enlisted Mike to organize a team, and he started recruiting local talent and colleagues from his last campaign. Bob Urbanski, the guy I spoke to before, uh, spoke about before, the chairman of Buttigieg's campaign, had been a Donnelly donor, had been a donor to Governor Joe Kernan, who was another Buttigieg backer who I mentioned. Um, and now let's get to Black Man and Graham. So this donation caught my eye immediately. It's $10,000 coming from Flower Mound, Texas. And I had to do a little digging, so lots of pity my way. I had to actually do the work that I'm supposed to do here. 
Um, Thomas Black is the partner at the law firm who gave Buttigieg $10,000, again, before the campaign had even announced. I was unable to find any connection between Thomas Black of Flower Mound, Texas, and Pete Buttigieg of South Bend, Indiana. However, Thomas Black went to Notre Dame. So did Joe Donnelly. So did tens of thousands of people. Doesn't necessarily mean anything. But, but, Senate disclosure forms show that in the aughts, 2006-2007, Joe Donnelly had been paid for legal services by Black, Man, and Graham to the tune of $18,000. So Black, Man, and Graham had very strong connections to Joe Donnelly, who, as Buttigieg himself said, was, was the source of a lot of the people and resources that Mike Schmuel was able to pull in. So he, Buttigieg maybe wasn't the product of a political machinery, but he certainly benefited from a borrowed political machinery. And again, that, that's, you know, that's how politics works. Of course you're going to do that. But again, there's, there's, there's the question of, we can't ask him about this because he won't say whether he has the forms or will release them. We, we, we can't ask him about what it means that he characterizes himself as not coming from a machine when we, as they say, we've got the receipts. He's coming from Joe Donnelly's machine. Not necessarily only Joe Donnelly's machine, but that's one of them. Um, and Buttigieg talks about, he talks about the machines that Dvorak and Hammond uh, have. And when I asked Hammond, I was actually able to get to Hammond and ask him, Dvorak did not respond, uh, but I asked Hammond, you know, were you the political machine in this race? And the answer he gave me has the initials B and S. I can't say it on YouTube. Um, and he even says that once he saw, uh, he told me, Hammond told me that when he saw Buttigieg's first filing, he knew they were done. So Buttigieg describes the other two. He goes into some detail on their machinery, and says, but then he says, many of the community leaders I, re I respected most were offering not only to support me, but also to help raise enough money to get me started. Community leaders supporting a politician and helping them raise money, that's a machine. That's what we talk about when we talk about a political machine. And, and what we contrast that with is a genuine grassroots movement of support where you share your ideas and people are so attracted to those ideas that they tell other people who've never met you, who have no connections, whether it be through academia or McKinsey or your political work. These are just people on the street, right? Uh, and they decide, this guy is saying something that I've been waiting to hear. The one big example of a machine that Buttigieg gives in his book is a former county chairman, Democratic Party chairman named Butch Morgan. Guy ended up actually doing prison time not too long afterwards uh, for forging petition signatures. Buttigieg writes about his meeting with Butch Morgan when he's still not sort of publicly in the race. And Butch... Butch's goal in this meeting is to assess Buttigieg's viability. He wants to kick the tires and see, who have you got? Who's even behind you? So it says in Buttigieg's book, Butch had done his homework on the local landscape to see where I might get support. And to make his case, Buttigieg gives him an example. He says, quote, I mistakenly told him I had a shot at earning the backing of Carl King, whom I had come to think of as a mentor. Butch called Carl on the spot and got Carl to make it clear he was backing Mike Hammond while I, Pete Buttigieg, looked on awkwardly. And the reason that matters is that Buttigieg is not able to identify people outside of these existing political connections in South Bend who do support him, as he himself recounts in his book. So what does he do? Right? The, the county chairman, you don't, county chairman doesn't have to support you, but obviously you want him to. County chairman's not going to support you, at least in the primary. What are you going to do? So he writes in his book, talking about leaving the meeting with Butch Morgan. Quote, it was clear 
as I left party headquarters that we would have to outmaneuver the party in order to win. In other words, Butch Morgan had just determined that, that Buttigieg did not have widespread retail politics, door-knocking support. There was no massive ground uh, swell of grassroots support for him. And Buttigieg gets caught on that, and he literally says in his own words, I would have to outmaneuver the guy that he has just described as the master of retail politics in South Bend. He even talks about one way he's going to, oh, he also says I would have to outwork and outwit them, which by the way, absolutely did. So when I, if I was a little bit surprised by how well he did in Iowa, I was only a little bit surprised. There was a part of me that was kind of expecting he's going to pull the same thing. Which, by the way, is good. That's a sign that he's smart, right? That's a sign that he's organized and an effective manager. There are lots of pluses that you can associate with this. Um, but if you're going to act as though it's purely grassroots, no connection to machinery, then we should at a minimum have the information to hold you accountable for that claim. And one of the ways he says he was able to do well in South Bend was that people would make mistakes about him. They would think things that were not true. Quote, depending on their own background, right, based on, this is, this is uh, Northern Indiana, right? Lots of uh, Eastern European heritage there, families. Depending on their background, people could assume Buttigieg, the name Buttigieg was Hungarian, Polish, Serbian, Czech, or Belgian all of which carried their own tribal loyalties. So he's openly counting on people mistakenly think he's not of Malta, Maltese descent. So that's my, that's my rundown. We literally went through and identified each individual um, donor. We looked at who were the owners of the businesses. We tracked their business dealings with the city. And um, I'm kind of bummed we never got out the full story. But again, one of the things that was so shocking to me was that there were literally only four non-white donors. Um, they, they, I believe, all had business or political connections. One was a UAW employee from, uh, from southern Indiana around Indianapolis. Another was a state rep from Maryland, I believe. Uh, and then there was... Uh, a Chicago, uh, a woman who um, had worked in the Chicago, in recruiting in Chicago, which of course is where Buttigieg did his uh, time with McKinsey. At least that's where he was based. He was apparently all over the place. And if you've followed our reporting, you know that we have talked a little bit about the kind of influence that Urbanski apparently had, his campaign manager, excuse me, chairman, who gave $10,000, who donated the office space, and apparently had a fair amount of influence, or an unfair, if you want to see it that way, with Buttigieg on the issue of the police department, as the, as the documents that we reported on uh, describe, and potentially on other areas as well. So, um, what does this all mean? That's up for you to decide, right? But I did want to highlight the parallels between the way he has campaigned this year, not the product of any political machinery, and the way he campaigned um, back in 2011, virtually the same language, virtually the same pitch, the varying degrees of, of uh, veracity behind them, that's up for you folks to judge. So, um, boy, I see you guys are kicking in all kinds of super chats today, which is really kind of you, and I do want to emphasize, as always, that as much as your, your financial support makes what we do possible, so does your emotional support, your expressions of support, your, your, the work you do so, to support us by sharing. If you, can't, if you can't donate financially, you are still helping just by being part of the conversation, which I swear I will make two-way in a minute, um, but also by sharing what we do with other people. So thank you to those of you who are kicking in cash, and thanks uh, also to those who, of you who are donating your hearts and your time. All right, let's see what you folks have to say. Uh, um, okay, I'm going to do my best now to not honor in the chat sort of gratuitous Buttigieg kicking, okay? Um, 
These are substantive things that I'm trying to talk about, but I don't want us to get into, you know, well, uh, he's just a robot doing the billionaire's bidding. Reality is more complicated than that, and, and I don't want to cast aspersions on the guy's motives. We can ask the questions, but I don't want to assume the answers. So that's, that's where I'm going to be. Um, I don't know how much <laughs> I'm going to have from you guys that fits that criteria, but we'll see. Uh, Real Life Jolie says almost 4.4% of his donations were women. LOL, I guess most women in South Bend saw through his fakery too. Um, Sherry says we have very sensitive malarkey meters. Um, let's see. Um, Sue T says, you'll never hear about this on the mainstream media. Keep up the awesome investigation. Well, we actually did post, um, we did post uh, these filings. And I don't know if you noticed, but the, uh, the ABC News did a story a week or so ago on Bob Urbanski. And they referred to the fact that the filings are not officially available. But then they said they had access to some or something like that, which... As far as I'm aware, I'm the only person who posted them. So the mainstream media do sometimes refer to our reporting, but they don't necessarily always say that that's where they're getting it. So you're welcome, Mickey Mouse. Uh, and thank you, Sue T, uh, who closes with Keep Up the Awesome Investigation. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Let's see, Sherry Addis says, oops, I just lost it. Sherry Addis says, some big flubs that machine has made. They need to recalibrate their bury the bodies sprocket. Um, Sam Teffler has some unkind words about the South Bend Tribune. Uh, Sarah says, how is it legal for PB to have donors outside South Bend? Is that always legal in U.S. cities? So one thing I discovered in looking at this stuff, Sarah, that's an excellent question. Not only does he have donors from outside South Bend, but he's got a donor giving $10,000. That's like almost five times the amount you can give to a candidate for president. Um, Indiana doesn't just have uh, weak record retention laws. They have hilarious campaign finance laws. So you can, I don't even know what the cap is if there even is one, but you can give a lot of money. And four years later, all signs of it will have disappeared. Um, <clears throat> Real Life Jolie says, Hey, Jonathan, are you at home or still in a South Bend hotel? Just curious about how to interpret the setting here. Yeah, that's all on me. <laughs> I'm no longer in South Bend. And Jolie uh, super chatted us $5. So thank you very much. Um, that, that'll go towards <laughs> neatening up the place a little bit. Um, Kumar Scoot Kakaria says, uh, wow, this is sloppy corruption. I'm honestly shocked by that. It's a really fascinating dynamic. I made, I made a big mistake when I first went to South Bend. I dismissed, I minimized the complaints I heard about the local media. And, and I will say, I've relied on a fair amount of work that the local media did at the time. There has been unquestionably good work by the local media um, digging stuff up, coming up with information that people didn't want out there. Absolutely. But particularly when it comes to concerns being expressed by disenfranchised people of color, black people, um, Hispanic people in the community, it's more noticeable there that concerns have not been heard. And by the way, there are also there have been biases, I would say, in their coverage of Pete Buttigieg. One example where I'm personally in the mix, back in September, I reported that the documents that the city has had for years allege that police were talking to Urbanski and another donor of Buttigieg's to get Buttigieg to get rid of the black chief. I report that none of the local media mention it at all. Ultimately, the Common Council starts talking about our reporting and about whether or not our reporting means they don't need the tapes. When the South Bend Tribune 
now starts referring to it because the Common Council is talking about it. They mentioned the, the racist rhetoric that we describe. They don't talk about the ways that Buttigieg himself is implicated in those documents. No mention, not a word, not a hint. Um, real, real life Jolie says, P.S. I'm sorry I can't afford more than a $5 super chat at a time, really. No one, no one, no one should feel bad if you cannot kick in. When I express my gratitude for those who do, that's, that's me saying thank you the way I say thank you, I hope all the time, to all of you for your support. Um, so please do not feel bad. The fact that people can't kick in more than five bucks to, to support something that they appreciate that gives them some, some sense of fulfillment and satisfaction, that's something we should all feel bad about, right? That's messed up. So do not feel bad. Do not kick yourself around. Channel that into making things better, right? However we can. Um, maybe it's supporting us, but more likely it's supporting a candidate, someone who's actually going to get there and affect direct change. As a media outlet, all we can do is like hope for second order indirect change. We can influence people to care about things. We don't pass laws. We don't write executive orders. So please do not feel bad. Um, let's see. Uh, Francis Wolf says, I really think that the Sanders people will be using our video in an ad. <laughs> um, Tony Barnes says, I don't understand the obsession TYT has with Pete Buttigieg. Thank you, Tony Barnes, for asking. I don't know if you come from uh, any of the South Bend Barnes lines, but uh, regardless, I really appreciate you asking the question. And uh, in fact, I've been thinking about doing a video apologizing to Pete Buttigieg for this reason. Uh, and I reserve the right to repeat myself in a later video because Tony's making me give up my idea here. Back in March, almost a year ago now, I was done with looking into the Fellowship Foundation, aka the family, the Christian group in DC, and I thought, okay, it's time to start looking at presidential politics. Uh, and I thought, of all the people who looked viable, only one had not really been vetted at even a state level, let alone a federal level. Obviously, that was Pete Buttigieg. Um, and so I went to South Bend and I started doing some reporting, um, simply because that seemed like the area where I was most likely to be able to come up with something that other people hadn't yet. I assumed I would have maybe a few months of reporting on Pete Buttigieg. And the reason I assumed that was because I heard, like, literally the day after I got there, I had people starting to tell me, oh, by the way, this major famous newspaper is coming to town, or that massive TV news outlet is coming to town. So I thought, okay, I've got, it's only a matter of time before the big guys start eating my lunch. So I've actually had multiple points over the past year where I sort of envisioned, and to be honest, was kind of hoping, because I've got a ton of papers all over my desk in my bedroom and stuff like that that I would love to get rid of. I've been, I've been on some level hoping I could sort of pull back, shift uh, my attention to something else, because, because there would no longer be any benefit to me reporting on it, meaning other people would start beating me on stories, right? And so there was nothing left to do. The only, the only place where it makes sense for me personally and for TYT Investigates as an institution, to in, it, it, the only place it makes sense for us to invest our efforts is where there's some likelihood of return. And my calculation at the beginning was that everyone was going to get this level of vetting. And What's happened in the past few months, I've realized, is that the Associated Press did a really good piece, and they actually did beat me on one really important thing, which I still, which still eats at me. But with that exception, it, it hasn't materialized. Like the big vetting that I kept expecting from the big boys has not materialized in a sustained, deep way. 
And so as long as I'm the only guy who's going to report this stuff out, I cannot tell you how many times I talk to people who tell me that no one else has talked to them. And as long as that's true, and as long as I have sort of the institutional knowledge and connections, and as long as no one else is consistently beating on me on it, with that one AP exception, um, then it doesn't make sense for me to scrap what I know, drop the investment of time and resources that I've already made, and move on to something else. So to say I'm obsessed with, oh, so, but here's the apology. What I've kind of realized is I am being unfair to Pete Buttigieg because it seems to me, and this is totally self-aggrandizing, I will own that, it seems to me that no one's really getting this level of, of uh, vetting. Now that's not an entirely fair assumption, but the fact that Pete Buttigieg has been so high in the polls for so long, and I'm still mostly alone on this stuff, has me questioning whether others are getting, are getting the attention they should. And for all I know, they're not. In which case, yeah, of course it's going to look from the outside like I'm obsessed with Pete Buttigieg. Now, there was that story about Amy Klobuchar and the, and the guy she sent away who it looks like might be innocent. So it's not like no one is looking at any of this stuff, but I can kind of see why from the outside it looks like I'm obsessed with Pete Buttigieg. So all I can do is tell you that I am not. There are professional incentives for me to continue to capitalize on the investments I've already made in my reporting and my contacts. Um, okay, uh, let's see, um, okay, you guys are all beating up Tony, come on, be, be nice, let's be polite here. <laughs> um, Tony Barnes makes the point, yeah, but Donald Trump is way more dangerous, way more. So here's my thinking on that. If you know that Galactus is coming to your world to destroy your world, and you know there's only going to be room for one person to fight Galactus, you don't, you don't just say, well, whoever wants to fight him gets to go fight him. You figure out, well, who's got weaknesses? Who's got strengths, right? You test the people who are potentially going to go into battle against Galactus. And if, if that involves putting them through some rigor, that's what you do. That's what a primary process is for. The vetting, the, the attacks on each other, the, the adversarial journalism, it doesn't mean you're for Trump. It means you support a system in which, that is supposed to produce the best person to take on Trump, right? It's, it's, I'm not sure what you think that process would look like otherwise. If any attack or any criticism of any Democrat is, all, is out of bounds, how are you supposed to, to yield, how is that system supposed to yield the best opponent for Trump? I don't, I don't understand the thinking there. Okay. Um, Tony Barnes says, okay, I just hope people support whoever the nominee is, even if it's Pete. I, 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 I get that concern. Um, and look, it's not like there aren't people out there who say, well, if, uh, if my candidate doesn't win, I'm not going to vote for against Trump. Um, but I don't think, I haven't seen anything to suggest that Pete Buttigieg is uniquely bad or different from any of the other candidates. Um, if, if anything, I talked to Kenny Marks, the Firefighters Union president, who said that Buttigieg fooled him when he endorsed him back in 2011. And the, the way he says Buttigieg fooled him was into thinking he wasn't a typical politician, which means the critique is basically he's a typical politician. But he also happens to be espousing some really progressive policies, right? Now, you can certainly dispute which version he seems to be endorsing at the moment, uh, that's fine, I get that. But I don't think that there's, um, you know, just the, the fact that we're talking about this means nothing more than we think it's worth asking people to judge about some of these specifics. And by the way, I will say, I first put in my request to speak with people to judge back in April, and I believe he's talked to Fox News on multiple occasions, says he'll talk to anyone, that kind of thing has talked to much smaller outlets than TYT. 
not talking to us. Um, and the only thing I can tell is that we're the only ones who are less interested in his Middle East peace process than we are in asking very specific questions, which he will not, I guarantee you, see coming um, on camera. And if you saw the Vice um, Brown and Black Forum last month, they, they grilled Buttigieg about our reporting. And it was quite clear that he was not being responsive to the specific questions that were being asked him about the specific facts that we reported. So part of the reason we keep reporting is because he keeps ducking, right? Uh, if, if we could get some of these answers on the record, that would save me a lot of time, right? I wouldn't have to uh, go galloping across South Bend, chasing down people that I'm trying to get to talk to me. I wouldn't have to go pouring through public records. I wouldn't have to go uh, filing requests for non-public records. I wouldn't have to do a lot of stuff. Um, I could clean up the mess back there. So uh, I would be happy to drop the Pete Buttigieg obsession, but um, that would be a lot easier to do if I had some co cooperation, right? Let me sit down with him on camera for half an hour. Um, let me get some questions answered that have literally not been answered since April. Questions that I've asked and re-upped repeatedly and said, by the way, this question still stands, blah, blah, blah. I've said that in emails for months now. So um, one thing to understand is that the way the campaign is dealing with me, I, I can't, I have no particular insights other than what I've seen from the outside, but it's very consistent with a very specific strategy to, to manage us, right? Uh, they, they are very careful not to go to war with us because then that becomes a story and then that draws attention to the substance of what we're reporting. Uh, they, don't, they don't confirm our reporting. And um, my understanding is that they, they issue non-denial denials when they're asked about it by other people. In other words, they don't say it's not true because then they've got a fight on their hands, they suggest that it's unsubstantiated, which by the way is a comment they've also given to me directly. So I'm not saying they say one thing to them and others, other things to me. They've said to me, that, that's unsubstantiated, which by the way, of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. I'm asking you to substantiate it. You're declining to. That's why it's unsub unsubstantiated, because you won't admit it, <laughs> right? The second you admit it, it'll be, it'll be substantiated. That's the only way it could be. So. The only reason to say it's unsubstantiated is because you're not in a position to say it's not true. Um, and for all of their griping about my unsubstantiated reporting, if you saw The Root had a, a piece recently, not the one I collaborated on with Mike Harriet of The Root, but Mike did a follow-up where he posted an email exchange he had with the Judge campaign after the fact. And they took issue with the way he described some things in the article. And when they were pushing back on Mike and what he said, what was the source they used, presumably a credible source, to push back? It was me. They linked to my reports. They said, as Jonathan reported, it was very weird, the, the fact that they didn't even use my last name. It made me think, ooh, am I a known, am I a, am I a first name entity within the, Buttigieg campaign, that's a little like, whoa, I did not think that I was on their radar to that level, but that's how they referred to me in the email, as Jonathan says, or something to that effect. So when it comes to other media re re uh, re picking up on our reporting, it's unsubstantiated. When it comes to pushing back on someone else's reporting, then may I refer you to Jonathan's reporting. So Again, that's not a dumb strategy, right? That's the way you do it. Uh, we have in the past month or so gotten more attention for our reporting from Vice, from the Associated Press. Um, so, uh, and certainly Crystal Ball at the Hill has, has um, been paying attention for months, having me on the show on occasion, stuff like that. So I don't remember what the question was, but I'm pretty sure I nailed it. Um, Kumar says he didn't just borrow the machine, uh, this is Buttigieg, he just jumped into a running campaign machine and drove it, period. Well, it's interesting because it, there, there's, um, there's definitely some aspects of that, but there's also Harvard money there, there's Oxford money there. Uh, so there, it's not just one machine, it's kind of like he was able to 
Um, and the ABC piece, by the way, says that Urbanski first talked to Buttigieg in 2009 about running for mayor. So the kingmakers in South Bend, they were aware of this guy pretty early on, and they were able to bring, obviously, considerable amount of cash to the table, but he also brought some connections of his own, political, academic, and especially the Venn diagram of those two. Um, Sarah says, so people should vote for Pete Buttigieg because he is the lesser evil than Trump? We want people to vote for someone not evil. I agree with that, Sarah, but I also disagree with that. Meaning, you, you, if you have two choices, we, we pick the lesser of two evils all the time. And I, I, the way I start to formulate this, is, I've, I've begun to think of this, is that the right to vote is clearly sacred. But I feel like we've let that kind of go to our, ha our heads, and now we see our own individual vote as sacred. Not the right to cast it, but, but the idea that for whom we cast it must not sully the sacred right to vote. That's not how it works. Um, you know, we, we have the right to choose between McDonald's and Burger King, but clearly when we do, that's the lesser of two evils. But we don't act as though the universe has deprived us of a choice. Those are, if those are the two restaurants nearby and those are our choices, we don't think about it. Uh, we make choices about our life all the time where we don't demand, you know, I don't want to get into whether it's a purity test or not, but we don't demand that it not be the lesser of two evils. Things are the lesser of two evils all the time. Right? No one keeps their kid out of school because none of the local schools are good enough. Okay, some people do, but let's not talk about them. Um, Imperator 1 says, so we should have a serious conversation about the blue no matter who argument. Um, CET, I'm not sure what CET or SET is responding to, says agreed, but, so what do you like about Pete? And there's plenty of things to like about Pete Buttigieg. Um, I know people in South Bend who love the guy and don't hate me. So they, they are able to like, that's the sign of genius, I guess, is to have like room in your brain for potentially contradictory conflicting ideas. They love Pete, but they also, uh, they believe that my reporting is true and, and they encourage me to continue doing it. Uh, Dornier says it's a primary, so I'm focused on the candidate that has the best policies. Generic 2858 says, if Pete is willing to be part of corruption on a small level, what do you think he will do on a national level? Or should I say, look the other way about? Part of what I'm talking about, I think, is that corruption is a scale. And, and as I think we've seen with Trump, it's not that unusual for someone to be involved in corruption and not see it as corruption. When you know that your intentions are good, when you know that you're not uh, planning to compromise things that you believe in, in return for money, then it's very easy to do things which can still be considered corrupt, right? Um, depending on the access that you grant and to whom. And, and um, you know, for instance, in terms of hiring, right? You can make what you think is the best, most honest personnel choice for all of your department heads, do each and every one with integrity, and still end up with a non-diverse administration. And at no individual point did you do something that was overtly corrupt, but the aggregate of your decision-making is problematic, to say the least, right? You can get there, and if, you, and if all you think about is those individual decisions, and never view the totality of your decision-making for that context and for the team that that gives you, forget fairness, you've now got a team that's a, a very blinkered silo of, of America. And that's bad for your team. Even if each individual person would be the best for that job, you've now assembled a bad team. Um, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm probably going to wrap soon. I can feel my throat starting to go. <laughs> um,
and I love the conversation you guys are having, but I'm also out of step with it. So, um, Tony Barnes says, you think Pete would take away your health care and cut Social Security? Blows my mind. And I, I think that's a fair point. I don't, I don't, I mean, look, uh, I, I'm not up on Pete Buttigieg's record on Social Security, or I shouldn't say his record, but his platforms, his positions. But I haven't seen anything that suggests that he, uh, yes, over the weekend he talked about wanting to cut the deficit. And that's, but that that's all very mainstream Democratic stuff. Um, you know, there's any number of videotapes out there. I don't want to open a can of worms here of Biden talking about wanting to cut Social Security. Um, but I don't think there's any indication that, you know, Pete Buttigieg is out of the norm of the Democratic candidates when it comes to policy on health care and Social Security. Jay Mills says, Tony, you are not other people. They do not have your worldview or life experience. They are going to do whatever they want, with or without your consent. Mayor Pete is going to lose to Trump. Come on, guys. Let's not be insulting here. <laughs> okay, please. Um, Curious Cleo says, it's not that we are forgetting Trump or his abilities, but we should not be so quick to just replace him that we do not take the time to determine what the replacement will do. Not to mention whether the person is going to be able to replace him. Um, Tony Barnes says, I've done plenty of research. I just don't watch only TYT. Don't forget, TYT is very biased towards Bernie. So that is true. That is true. Um, TYT is primarily uh, opinion programming. And if you're not familiar with us, Tony, um, TYT Investigates, which is where I am, we were created to do... Uh, I'm not sure objective reporting is possible, but impartial reporting. In other words, we don't take sides. Um, we don't. We can report on um, people to judge, but that doesn't mean we're then going to say, and that's why you shouldn't vote for them, or that's why you should. Right? That's not. That's not what we do. That's what TYT does. So, and I've worked at. I've worked at any number of mainstream outlets. So I know both the good and the bad and the BS about what impartiality means. And um, I think if you've watched a number of my videos, if you've read my reporting, you're, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find any signs that we're not being impartial about it. Now, Buttigieg might not like it, they might think I'm picking on him, but my reporting is still credible enough for them to cite it uh, when they're talking with the root. And again, before we report our stuff, we pretty much generally give them uh, if not what they consider enough time, at least some time, to come back to us and say, no, 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 that is not true. That is absolutely false. Let us explain why. Uh, <clears throat> Grammy Bernie Bro says, Jonathan, I heard Pete put in a lot of roundabouts and a $26 million skating rink in South Bend. Can you see if either of those projects had any connections to his donors? So... <sighs> That was actually, that's from Grammy Bernie Bro, and, and that was actually my mission when I first came to town, um, was to look at the standard stuff of like, did someone give you money and then get contracts from the city? And the answer to that is yes. We did that story back over the summer. However, because of the way the city is structured, the city government, it's not quite as satisfying to make those connections. Um, the Board of Public Works, actually gets sign off. I, I think it goes to the Common Council. Um, but the mayor doesn't have direct oversight. He appoints the Board of Public Works. So you can certainly raise the questions, which we did back in uh, back in uh, August, maybe. Francis Wolf says, man, JL, thank you for all this work. Just know that your TYTI fam really appreciate you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, it means a lot. Um, and that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's why no one should feel bad if you can't lend, lend money because the, the, the verbal support, the social media support, all of it, 
Um, you know, that's real. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's see. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, Real life Jolie says, Jonathan, because Jonathan's such a nice guy, he's trying to play both sides. I, so I get that I, I got beat up by this, I think, uh, for this. And I say beat up tongue in cheek. I don't, you, no one was out of line. I think when I, when, because I hate both sides. I hate both sidesism. And I promise you guys, I was fighting that more than 10 years ago when I was working for Keith Oberman at Countdown. So trust me, I, I'm not only with you, I it's possible that I got there before you. What I reject, though, is the idea of dismissing out of hand the idea that the people on the other side are evil or corrupt or bought or whatever it might be. Um, I'm not saying that never happens. I just don't think that's a useful way to think about human behavior. Comparative reasoning is 44 years old today and upvotes each show. And I'm telling you this not because they specifically asked me to give them a birthday shout out. Um, I'm asking this in part because of that, but also because I wanted to leave on an up note. So happy birthday, comparative reasoning, and thank you for upvoting each, each show. Um, and I hope you have a great day and a great birthday. There, that's, that's me not both sizing it. I am firmly on the side of happy birthday comparative reasoning. Uh, Afalabi M, sorry if I'm getting your name wrong, says Pete's a smart and ambitious person. He knows every president becomes a multimillionaire. Just look at how Obama has done. There is no doubt in my mind that this is all he cares about. I think, I think, if Pete Buttigieg's goal were to become a multimillionaire, there were probably much shorter routes he could have taken. Just stay at McKinsey. I think the guy wants to be president. Now, you might not know or like his reasons for that, but everything I've heard suggests that he has wanted to be president probably since before he could pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> Tony Barnes says, I saw Pete 13 times in town halls and he wants to expand it. I'm assuming you're talking about social security or healthcare. Says, I trust him. I know that makes me a horrible person to some. I don't, I, you know, again, I, I, I appreciate that I saw elsewhere in the chat that po folks are letting you know, Tony, that doesn't make you a horrible person. Pete Buttigieg is not a horrible person. We are all flawed people, myself certainly included. And when we run for president, we are supposed to, one, get better. Two, explain why we have not been good or as good as we could be. And three, be held accountable for it and possibly lose the, the, the nomination if people don't like the way we respond uh, compared to other people. So less than perfect does not mean horrible, right? Um, uh, and that's true of Tony Barnes and it's true of Pete Buttigieg and hopefully it's true of me as well. Uh, I'm not saying I don't have my moments, you know, where I could say, yep, that was horrible, totally horrible. But as a person, considered in toto, as a biological, psychological entity, uh, I hope I'm at least a, a hair better than, than um, horrible. Joseph Murphy says, did we ever come up with a name for this cohort? No, we did not. Um, that's okay. <laughs> um, Hold on, I got, a, uh, I got a challenge here, which I just lost. Um, Grammy Bernie Bro says, so Jonathan, which school would you put your child in? The one where only 12 kids die every day or the one where only 10 do? 
Those are your only choices, and the, stoits, the state says you have to pick one. Well, the first thing I would want to know is how many children attend each school? Um, because if it's the same number of kids uh, at each school, then I would want to pick the one where fewer kids die every day. Um, I mean, I think that's pretty clear, right? That's pretty easy, right? If you, you, you're dying of hunger, you're on a desert island, there are two plates of food or two apples, one has received, uh, you know, uh, uh, a centiliter of poison injected into it, and one has received uh, one, one, one hundredth of that. Which apple do you eat? I eat the one with less poison. I don't reject it because I don't do the lesser of two evils. I do the hell out of lesser of two evils. All the time, every day. Look at my hair, people. Obviously I could do better, right? I've, I've chosen the lesser of two evils in terms of whatever this whole situation is going on. We do it all the time in most of our decisions. We virtually never insist on perfect, pure, uh, ideal. All right, with that, uh, <laughs> Real Life Jolie says, you're cute with that hair though, Jonathan. So that's obviously my cue to say, uh, you've all lost your minds. And, um, but I thank you for it and for sharing it with me. I'm gonna take off, um, I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I'll do my full Pete apology and, and try to explain that a little better than I did to Tony. Um, if I didn't get to something, cause I, I did scroll through a little quickly, please repeat it in the comments. So I can answer there. I can't answer in the chat after the video is done. After the live video is done, it it, it corks out and I can't I can't uh, respond there anymore. So hit me in the chat and I'll, I'll get to you there eventually. Um, in the meantime, uh, go do something, right? If we're all concerned about what's going to produce the best outcomes, go fight for that outcome. Go make that happen. Uh, if if it just means sharing our content to to places where you think that'll do good, that's great. But there are probably better ways as well, right? Get involved. Um, make, make, instead of worrying about whether X is reasonable or, or realistic, make it realistic, right? Anything is realistic if we all collectively decide it, it is. All right. Um, but no matter how you go about that, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and I'll see you soon. 11.30 a.m. weekdays every day here at TYT Investigates. Thanks, bye.